Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate and a two-part interview with the American ambassador. David Mulford completed four years in India last week. Tomorrow I shall talk to him about how Indo-US relations have matured and expanded during that period. But first, today is a subject on everyone's mind, the Indo-US nuclear deal. Ambassador Mulford, critics and opponents of the Indo-US nuclear deal describe it as dangerous folly. They say that the only reason your government is interested is because it wants to convert India into a subordinate ally in South Asia. How do you respond to that? Well, it's completely untrue. The reasons why this deal was initiated by the President of the United States were based on the statement that he made shortly before that initiative was taken that the United States wanted to assist India in achieving its global vision of emerging as a major economic power in the world. And in doing so, he focused on one of the items that were thought to be a major constraint for India's future development, now, namely energy. Advocates of the deal have absolutely no doubt that this is in India's best interest. But what's in it for the United States? Well, the United States, um, first of all, uh, would like to see India continue to grow and emerge as a major player in Asia. Secondly, uh, we would like to see India pursue cleaner energy policies. And uh, a key part of that is civil nuclear development. And finally, we think that it's very, very important that the global architecture for nonproliferation should include India, which has been outside that system for 35 years. In other words, the president didn't believe it's sensible to leave one-sixth of humanity outside of the system for the indefinite future. Many people in India say that the United States itself hasn't installed a new nuclear reactor for over two decades. They suspect that, in fact, the motivation might be that this is the best way of keeping your own nuclear industry alive. Well, the fact is that the United States has built, within its current nuclear uh, industry, 27,000 megawatts of new nuclear facilities in the way of upgrades and reforms of existing old facilities. It's true we haven't built a new facility, but this construction represents the largest activity in the industry over these past years and the highest possible technologies. The Indian papers are speculating that in fact the American government might have put pressure on the Indian government not to pursue the Iranian gas pipeline. Is there any truth to that speculation? I don't think that's true at all. What we've done, and it's been true now for as long as I've been here, when that issue has come up, we have indicated to members of the government that we have legislation on our books, which is well known, which is uh, directed towards discouraging development of natural resources in Iran. And this is legislation that has not been used, but it's there and could come into play. And we feel it's only appropriate to remind people that it's there. So it's just a reminder, nothing more? Yes. All right, let's come to certain specific concerns with the 123 agreement. To begin with, if the 123 goes through, would India lose its right to carry out further nuclear tests? Not at all. It can make that decision any time. It's a sovereign state. So to paraphrase, are you suggesting that India retains its sovereign right to carry out further nuclear tests, but America at the same time retains its right to respond as per its own domestic legislation? Well, it's very clear that India is free to do as it wishes with regard to future testing. It's also clear that if it does test, then certain things may or may not happen that are prescribed in the agreement. So it's all visible there transparently for everybody to see. Secondly, critics of the deal, like Dr. Gopala Krishnan, a former director of the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, say that the 123 doesn't have sufficiently binding assurances on lifetime supplies of fuel. How could you reassure him that, in fact, he's incorrect? Well, I would suggest that he read the language that was negotiated between the president and the prime minister in March of 06, and which, began, which became the language governing the issue of fuel and safeguards in perpetuity. This language was accepted by the Indian government and was thought by both sides to serve the purposes. So I think that's a closed issue. So you think this is an invalid concern? I think it is. Thirdly, critics point out that the 123 agreement doesn't have a clear and unequivocal right to reprocess. Is that a fact? That's not true. The, the negotiations on that point were long and drawn out and the uh, the right was granted 
up front for reprocessing as a part of the 123 agreement. That's when you clear. say it's granted up front, are you saying it's a prior consent to use the language the Indian government It was government granted uses? as a right up front, but of course there has also to be, as India proposed itself, a uh, special pro reprocessing facility which they've agreed to and they put forward as, a, as their proposal and which we found acceptable. And that has to be put into existence, etc., before uh, reprocessing actually begins. But the right to reprocess is recognized in the agreement. I'll tell you why there is a certain amount of ambiguity, perhaps even doubt on this score. The 123 says that the parties grant each other consent to reprocess. But then it adds, to bring these rights into effect, they have to agree on arrangements and procedures within 18 months. What would happen if after 18 months that agreement on arrangements and procedures isn't happening? Well, I'm not going to speculate on the future as it may unfold, but what's clear is the language was negotiated carefully. It was aimed at uh, closing that particular issue, which it did. Both sides agreed, and uh, we'll go forward if this agreement is put into effect and honor our side of that agreement. So what you're saying in effect is don't worry yourself with the unpredictable and the unknowable because it's not worth worrying about. Well, I just don't think you can predict the future and I wouldn't, I mean, I think this agreement as well as any agreement could possibly do addresses the major issues of which reprocessing was obviously one. A fourth criticism made is that the 123 doesn't necessarily make for full civil nuclear cooperation. They say that India's ability to acquire technologies connected with enrichment, reprocessing and heavy water is dependent upon an amendment. Is that a problem? Well, I don't think it's a problem because that happens to be U.S. law and it applies to the whole world, including to India. And um, if there were ever to be a change in that, it would be a change in the underlying fundamental law. Uh, it would not be an India-specific change. So you're saying India is being treated like any other country yes. in the world? It's not being discriminated against? Certainly not. Finally, there is a certain amount of concern about America's right of return in the event that the 123 is terminated. In those circumstances, would any strategic reserves that India were to develop be secure? Well, yes, because the, uh, the language that was agreed, and coming back to the fuel supply language, uh, made provisions for the creation of a strategic reserve with the help and assistance of the United States, incidentally. And um, if that strategic reserve is created in the right way, which is India's business to do, and managed in the right way, which again is India's business to do, there should be absolutely no problem in maintaining the sanctity of that reserve uh, because we have agreed that in the circumstances you mentioned, our fuel might be subject to a right of return. Uh, by that time, I suppose, the fuel would be spent fuel, but the right of return would apply to our fuel. We have limited the application of that to fuel from other sources. There's something very interesting what you said. You said that if India develops its strategic reserve in the right way and then manages it in the right way, it would be secure. Can I put something to you? Would the strategic reserves be secure if they were created with non-US fuel, which is not subject to a right of return? In my view, they would be. So the sensible thing would be to build the reserve with non-European fuel so that it's secure and use American fuel for actually running the plants. Well, you could look at it that way, certainly. And that would overcome these concerns and these fears almost completely. Well, it should do. In which case, my last question on this subject before I take a break. Would you accept that what the 123 agreement does is to make possible full civil nuclear cooperation with the NSG countries? And any perceived deficiency within the 123 itself could very possibly be made up by the rest of the NSG. But the important thing is without the 123, the door to the NSG would remain closed. Yes, the, the, um, I think uh, Minister Mukherjee put it succinctly when he said that the, the um, civil nuclear agreement was India's passport to the world. That is exactly correct. 
um, that if this deal is embraced and it is taken through the IAEA and safeguards are <coughs> negotiated successfully between India and the IAEA and we go to the NSG and we get a rule change there by consensus, India will then be free to deal with the entire civil nuclear world. And the paradox is that once the one, two, three is through, India doesn't necessarily have to deal with America, although no doubt you hope it will, but India will then be able to deal with the rest of the world. But without the one, two, three, India couldn't deal with anyone. That's a correct summary. We hope they'll deal with us, and we plan to be competitive as an industry. But there is no agreement or undertaking uh, that they have to do their business with the United States. It's a competitive market. And my belief is that India, if this goes through, will become the center of a major civil nuclear industry in the world. And, all and effectively competing with China, by the way, in the same field. And all of this depends upon the one, two, three, because the one, two, three is the key to a locked door. That's correct, and that has to be passed through the NSG. Ambassador Malford, let's take a break there. I want to come back and talk about the future. We'll be back in a moment's time. See you then. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with the American Ambassador. Ambassador Mulford, let's look to the future. How confident are you that India can achieve a satisfactory safeguards agreement with the IAEA? Well, the United States is not a party to that negotiation, and therefore um, I'm not informed about what exactly is going on in that negotiation. But I see no reason why a safeguards agreement can't be achieved. And um, I would be very surprised if that weren't, weren't achievable. After the IAEA, the next stage is the NSG, where America will in effect shepherd the deal. Yes. India is hoping for a clean and unconditional clearance. Are you confident that you could deliver that? Well, we're all hoping for that. But um, it has to be recognized that this is an extremely sensitive process. And just think about it. India has been granted a special exception by the United States in the global system. And we're asking a variety of countries who were not given that opportunity to have a special exception. And therefore, there are a mix of countries there, some of which who take the view that India is being rewarded inappropriately when it never signed the non-proliferation treaty, other countries who have very strong views on non-proliferation within their political structures. So that particular process is not going to be easy, and um, we're very um, keen to get started with it. Are you simply being cautious in the way you express yourself, or are you disguising a certain amount of doubt that India can get a clean, unconditional clearance? Oh, I think it's achievable, but I think it, it, it'll take some time and it'll take some political um, energy. One of the reasons people are concerned is because countries like Austria and the Netherlands are said to be pushing for a right of return of their own. Would that be acceptable to America? Well, I can't comment on what all these other countries might or might not want or do, uh, but I think it's fair to say that our opinion is very strongly that we hope the group will go for a relatively simple consensus and a clean solution to the, uh, to the problem, and will not attempt to move beyond effectively the provisions that have been so carefully negotiated in the 123 agreement. So our hope is, and we're confident, if we get the opportunity to manage the process, that we will achieve it. So you're saying the NSG shouldn't bring back curbs and restraints which the 123 has lifted? Well, I think if they do that, it will make it uh, impossible to con conclude the deal. Now, you've repeatedly said that in an ideal world, you would like the deal to go back to the U.S. Congress for a final up-down vote whilst President Bush is still president. Yes. What's the deadline <clears throat> for that? I don't think it's sensible to, uh, in the case of the United States Congress, to set a deadline. The Congress will continue to function until it adjourns, and um, it is always possible that at some point in that process, there will be a willingness, if the opportunity arises, to make that final vote, which, after all, is an up-and-down vote. It's not a vote based on amendments and, and long uh, debate. It is an up-or-down vote on the basis of the safeguards agreement, the NSG change, and the 1-2-3 agreement itself. Now, at the moment, there is a lot of 
political questioning about the deal in India. There's a certain amount of opposition to it. How do Americans view this debate in India? I think in one word, uh, puzzlement, if I can describe that. It is that Americans are deeply concerned about nonproliferation. It's part of our culture. It has been for 60, 70 years. The United States Congress, with the president leading, took an initiative of historic importance. This resulted in a change of law to the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, the only time it's ever been changed. The change had to be addressed by both houses of Congress. And in each case, when the floor vote came in those bodies, there was strong bipartisan support. And at the se time of the Senate vote, which was 30 days after the 2006 election, in which the Congress changed hands, and there were deep, bitter, partisan divides in American politics, at the time of that vote, Democrats and Republicans stood up together and made a positive vote saying, this is important for the world, this is important for India, this is important for the United States, and in other words, they made a statesmanlike stand together in our political system. Afterwards, as the 1-2-3 agreement was negotiated, many members of Congress take the view that this agreement is extremely favorable to India. So when you add up all those things, I think Americans are puzzled that this agreement wasn't immediately embraced and activated by India. Let me put this to you. If for some reason India were not to go ahead with the deal whilst President Bush is president, would it therefore be the case that in the next two, three years that follow before a second agreement can be reached with a new administration, what might then be on offer to India may not be as advantageous or even as generous as what's available today? Well, my own opinion is that if the, if this is not processed in the present Congress, <clears throat> it is unlikely that this uh, deal will be offered again to India. It certainly would not be revived and offered by any administration, Democratic or Republican, before the year 2010, which is after the life of this particular administration in India. If it were to be revived, it would have to go through a committee process in the Congress. And I think the nonproliferation groups would insist on changes in many of the terms or additional conditions. So I think the atmosphere is changing. And therefore, I believe, and I know that both Republicans and Democrats believe in the United States, this is the time to finish this deal and to put it through the Congress. So in other words, you're saying it's now or maybe never. That's pretty close to it. Have you considered the possibility of personally meeting Prakash Karat and A.B. Bharatan to reassure them about their concerns? I have the impression that Mr. Karat is not interested in meeting with Americans. But knock on his door and But, but uh, I'm ready to meet with him at any time if he would wish. What will be the impact on the wider relationship if India doesn't move ahead? Well, I think that, that that's a very complicated question because the relationship has become so gigantic, as we will discuss in your next uh, section, that I would say that for the bulk of the relationship, and just to give a brief answer, um, I don't think it will damage that relationship, the private relations, civil, people-to-people, -people, companies, foreign direct investment, all the aspects that we follow every day. I do think that at the heart of the official bilateral relationship where in the past years, there has been this effort, and this is part of it, the civil nuclear, but not the only thing. A real effort has been made to overcome some of the distrust, suspicions, and misunderstandings of the past. And this is very, very important. And the civil nuclear deal was supposed to be, in a way, the vehicle that would lay those things to rest forever. So I think there has to be some concern about elements of trust and discretion at the core of that relationship. Not insurmountable, but I think it won't quite remove some of those problems that we both countries have been working to But you're to saying overcome. to me that it's a containable impact, it's not a damage. I think it probably is. Ambassador Marford, let's end this particular interview there. Tomorrow I want to talk to you about the wider relationship and how it's matured, changed and become complex. That's tomorrow night on CNBC TV 18 at 10.30 p.m. But for tonight, goodbye, good night.